Aiden rushed out of the building and shouted to Chris on the way that the rest of the day's plans would be pushed back. If Emma wouldn't answer his calls, he'd have to see her in person. When Aiden arrived at the hospital, he found that she wasn't there. No one could answer him as to where she had gone. When he found Dr. Kenzie, she told him that Emma had left the hospital in a hurry. Dr. Turner ran out while she was on the phone. She didn't answer me when I asked her where she went, Dr. Kenzie explained. Aiden nodded and ran out of the hospital. He drove straight back to his apartment. None of Emma's things were there, and it was clear that she had left in a hurry in the morning to go to surgery and had not returned. He called her again and again with no response. Aiden tossed his phone on the bed in frustration. Less than a minute later, it rang. Aiden picked up his phone and didn't bother to check the caller ID before he asked, Emma, is it you? The person on the other end of the phone said urgently, I'm sorry, is this Mr. Grant? This is Wendy's teacher. Yes, this is Mr. Grant, Aiden replied. The person on the other side said anxiously, We called you because we couldn't contact your wife. When Wendy was taking an afternoon nap, she disappeared. Disappeared? What? Aiden exclaimed. The person on the phone explained apologetically, Mr. Grant, I'm sorry. All of the children take an afternoon nap at 12.40 p.m. When the teacher went to wake them at 2, Wendy was gone. You couldn't find her at 2, but you only called me now? Aiden roared as he rushed out of the apartment. The teacher apologized to Aiden. I'm so sorry, Mr. Grant. Did you call the police? Aiden asked. He rushed into the elevator. I've reported it. I'll be at the kindergarten right away, he replied. Aiden hung up the phone and called Chris to meet him at the school. He rushed out into the rain and into the car. Aiden drove with one hand on the steering wheel and the other dialing Emma's number again and again. It usually took 30 minutes to get to Wendy's school, but he made the trip in 15 minutes. When he arrived at the kindergarten, Chris was already there and talking with the policeman. When Chris saw Aiden walking over, he quickly introduced him. Aiden, this is Officer Lee, Chris said. Officer Lee was a little nervous. He did not expect the missing child in the kindergarten to be the daughter of the director of SG Enterprises. Have you found anything? Aiden asked hurriedly. Officer Lee answered hesitantly. The school has security footage. We've looked through to find the moment that Wendy was taken. Aiden ignored Officer Lee and turned to Chris for more information. At 1.30, someone came in and took Wendy away. They're wearing a raincoat, so we can't see any details about their face. But we're checking the cameras to see if we can see any info about the car, he said. Aiden's face froze. When he realized that it had been more than two hours since Wendy had disappeared, he instructed Chris to arrange for some private investigators to get involved, in addition to the police. He tried Emma's phone again, but she still didn't respond. Emma's taxi had just arrived at the bridge. The person on the other end of the phone told her to go right to the side of the entrance. It was pouring now and the wind was picking up. Where is my daughter? Emma screamed into the phone. She knelt on the ground in frustration. The phone slipped out of her hands and hit the concrete and cracked, the screen turning black as the phone was soaked with rain. Suddenly, Emma saw rain boots in front of her. She raised her head and saw a person wearing a raincoat. She could not see his appearance clearly, but he was very tall. Our boss is waiting for you, the man said. Emma recognized his voice from the phone. She got up from the ground. You, it's you. Where is my daughter? If you want to see your daughter, shut up. The man gestured for her to follow him. Emma immediately shut her mouth and followed him down to a dock, all the way to a yacht. In the middle of the yacht, Wendy was tied to a chair. Wendy called out to Emma, Mommy! Little darling! Emma ran toward Wendy, but the man grabbed her arm. Let go of me! Emma struggled, but that man was too strong. She could not break free. Another voice came from behind Emma. Let go of her! Yes, boss. The man let go of Emma's arm. Emma ran to the chair and untied the rope on Wendy's body. She hugged her tightly. Then the same voice commanded, Lock the mother and daughter up. 
Emma turned around and met Carl's gaze. It's you. Yes, Emma. This is the second time we've met, he replied. Emma immediately understood why they kidnapped Wendy. Is this because of business, she asked. Looks like you're very bright, Carl said with a smile. That was a great guess. I am here. You can hold on to me as ransom. Can you let my daughter go? Emma shouted. Carl laughed. <laughs> Do you think that is possible? My daughter is only five years old. She doesn't know anything. Please just let her go. You can take me. Emma cried out. Carl ignored her and ordered the men beside him to take some photos of Emma and Wendy to send to Aiden. Okay, let's see Aiden's reaction now, Carl said. Chris had made progress in trying to find the man who took Wendy. He had figured out the car that took her using the security footage, and the private investigators were already tracking the vehicle. Aiden was walking away from the kindergarten. His phone rang. It was a message. Aiden opened the text to find a photo of Emma and Wendy. Emma was hugging Wendy, and she looked terrified. He shouted and Chris walked over to see what he was looking at. When he saw the photo on Aiden's phone, his face froze. A second later, a call came in from the same number. Let them go. I promise you everything, Aiden said immediately. Seems like these two are very important to you, Carl said from the other line. Mr. Occam, Aiden said. Ah, uh, yes, he replied. Seems like you remember me. What do you want? Aiden asked. Your money back? Officer Lee overheard Aiden and rushed to his side. Y you, y you can't make an agreement with kidnappers in private, he exclaimed. You need to cooperate with the police. Aiden glared at Officer Lee. Chris looked at Aiden and then said to Officer Lee, Officer Lee, you're no longer needed in this. Call the police off. Officer Lee swallowed and nodded obediently. All right, I will prepare the money for you. Just tell me where I need to go and what I need to do, Aiden said. Come here with the money. Three million. And come alone. By the Brooklyn Bridge. I'll send you the location. You have two hours. If you're not here by then, I'll throw your daughter and your lover into the sea, Carl said. Don't you dare hurt them, Aiden said. He clenched his fists. That will depend on your performance, Mr. Grant, Carl said. And then he hung up the phone. Aiden turned to Chris. He wants three million. I'm worried he's going to pull something, so we need to split up. Get someone to figure out where that photo was taken as soon as possible. I'll go get the money and bring it to him, he said. Chris got to work immediately. On the yacht, Carl approached Emma after he hung up the phone. I have two pieces of news for you, he told her. The first is that he's willing to pay three million for your safety. The second is that he will come alone. What are you trying to do? Emma asked. She had a bad feeling about this. We didn't get to discuss the terms of the agreement. He never asked who the three million dollars would free. So, who do you think he'll exchange it for? You or your daughter? He only gets to choose one, Carl said. You, y you lunatic. Emma was stunned for a moment. She rushed toward him with Wendy in her hands. The bodyguard stepped between them and Emma ran right into him. She fell to the ground holding Wendy. Take the baby away, Carl ordered. Emma screamed. She held on as tight as she could to her daughter, but she was no match for the bodyguards. They pulled Wendy from her arms and carried her away. Aiden rushed to the bank to prepare the three million for Carl before driving to the Brooklyn Bridge. On his way there, he got a call from Chris. They're on a yacht on the dock nearby, Chris said. His bodyguards are there. Got it. They can't know anyone else is with me, but send backup, he said, and hung up the phone. It was still raining, but Aiden drove faster than he should to get to the spot that Carl had sent him. He got out of the car at the dock and immediately saw the boat. Carl was surrounded by 10 armed bodyguards. Aiden walked toward the boat. When he was about a yard away from the steps, he stopped and placed a briefcase down in front of him. He unclasped the case to reveal stacks of cash. Your three million, 
he said to Carl. Perfect, Carl said. So, who do you want to trade the three million for? What? Aiden exclaimed. At that moment, a bodyguard dragged Emma out from the other side of the boat into Aiden's view. Aiden, Wendy is on the other side of the boat, Emma yelled. Aiden looked to the other side and saw a bodyguard holding Wendy, who was crying out for her parents. Carl grinned. So, who are you going to use the three million for? Your woman or your daughter? He asked. Aiden cursed at Carl. Aiden, choose Wendy. Emma shouted. Aiden closed his eyes. He felt that he was in physical pain. Emma and Wendy were the most important people to Aiden. Aiden could not bear to part with either of them. Aiden, choose Wendy! Emma kept yelling. Aiden opened his eyes and looked at Emma without blinking. Then he said word by word, I choose my daughter. Carl looked at Emma and then Aiden. Well then, it seems you made a choice. Let my daughter go, Aiden said. Carl smiled and turned to his bodyguard. Take the baby to the car. The bodyguard nodded and gestured toward the man who held Wendy. He walked off the yacht and placed Wendy into Aiden's car, then walked away and headed back onto the boat. Aiden's fists unclenched slightly. But as soon as the bodyguard was back on board, the yacht began to move. Carl, you... Aiden screamed. Suddenly, he spotted a figure in the back of the boat. It was Chris, soaking wet, climbing over the side of the boat. Tell me what you want me to do, Aiden asked. It's simple. Either she dies, or you die. Carl slowly took out a dagger and placed it on him his neck. Aiden shouted to stop him. Stop, I die. Hearing Aiden's promise, Emma started to struggle against Carl's grasp. The knife cut into her skin and drops of blood appeared. Aiden shouted and walked towards the bodyguards who had remained on land. Come and kill me, he yelled. On the boat, Chris had just disarmed one of the bodyguards and was moving on to the next. He had taken over the steering wheel and was guiding the boat right back to the dock. Go ahead and kill him, Carl ordered to his bodyguard. The bodyguard nodded. He had an iron rod in his hand. He lifted it up to swing at Aiden. Carl was watching with glee. Emma noticed he was distracted and quickly leapt out of his arms. The knife in his hand fell to the ground. Emma ran toward the edge of the boat and jumped into the water. The dock was close enough for her to pull herself up quickly. Aiden had kicked the bodyguard's legs out from under him. He ran toward Emma. But the boat was close enough to the dock now that Carl had jumped up and followed her. He was holding one of the iron rods and rushing up behind her. Aiden saw Carl pull the rod back to swing at Emma, and he sprinted to push her out of the way. Carl swung and hit Aiden's head. Aiden fell to the ground. Blood was gushing out of a wound in his head, but he was still strong enough to spot Carl standing next to him, and Aiden thrust his leg out to knock Carl over. He fell to the ground and dropped his iron rod. Aiden mustered all of his remaining strength to roll over and use his body to pin Carl down. You! Just as Carl opened his mouth, Chris came up behind him. He kicked Carl directly in the head and Carl lost consciousness. Emma was screaming as she watched blood gather under Aiden's head. We need to call an ambulance, she shouted. Chris was already calling on the phone. Emma took her sweater off to try and stop Aiden's bleeding. She covered his wound and held pressure with trembling hands. Chris had told the emergency services about the injury and they sent a medical helicopter. Emma only took her hands off of Aiden once the medics arrived and began to prepare Aiden to get into the helicopter. There were two doctors who had arrived with the helicopter. Emma felt paralyzed as she watched them put an oxygen mask on him. She began to chase after them as they wheeled him forward, but she was so weak she stumbled and fell. Chris came up from behind her and steadied her. Chris, I need to fly with them. We need to take him to our hospital. Don't let them touch the wound, she cried. Chris nodded. He helped her into the helicopter. Once she was in, she shouted at the pilot to head to her hospital. They hadn't used the landing pad yet, but she couldn't trust Aiden to be treated anywhere else. 
A crowd was waiting when they arrived. The doctors and nurses had been informed that a high priority trauma patient was arrived and they were prepared. They hadn't known that it would be Aiden. When they landed, Chris helped Emma get out of the hospital after Aiden and the medics. She almost fell over again when she tried to walk. Dr. Kenzie and a nurse rushed to her side. Dr. Kenzie was shocked when she first saw the wounds, but knew she needed to be honest with Emma. It doesn't look good, Emma. Dr. Kenzie said gently, we will run the tests, but we both know there will likely need to be surgery to stop the bleeding. This is something you can handle best, but I will be by your side, she said. Emma could barely walk. Chris walked with the stretcher inside the hospital and then came back to Emma's side. You need to operate, he said. There is no one better. Aiden needs you. He would want you to do this. Emma nodded. She felt like she was in a dream. Dr. Kenzie shouted instructions to the nurses ahead of them to prepare the operating theater. She asked Chris to help support Emma as she ran ahead to make arrangements. Emma could barely walk on her own as they led her toward the surgical wing. She moved so slow that by the time she reached the room, everyone else was already prepared. Dr. Turner, everything is ready. We are only waiting for you, Dr. Kenzie said. A nurse began to help Emma with her gown and her sterilization. You can do this, Emma, Chris said before he left to go to the waiting room. Emma entered the operating theater in a daze. Aiden lay on the surgical table with a light green surgical sheet over his body. He was attached to wires and tubes that made him seem like he was no longer human. The monitor showing his blood pressure and heartbeat beeped in the corner. Emma began to tremble. Her hands shook. She was usually calm and confident. She had made it through the toughest surgeries possible and stood and operated for hours. The rest of the surgical crew stood by her expectantly. Dr. Kenzie was there, and she knew that Dr. Kenzie could assist if things went wrong. But this was the type of surgery that would always be assigned to Emma first. There were few neurosurgeons who could handle this sort of case as well as she could. A nurse handed Emma a scalpel, but she was trembling so much she almost dropped it. She stepped back from the operating table and she began to shake so much that the scalpel dropped to the floor with a clank. The rest of the nurses and doctors looked on in awe. They had never seen her act like this, even with the toughest surgeries. I, I can't, she said, taking yet another step back from the table. Her surgical mask was damp with tears and she was shaking even more. She was the best neurosurgeon in the city, if not the country, but she could not operate on the love of her life. Emma bit her lips under her mask. Sweat dripped down her forehead. She could not move her hands. She could perform surgery on many patients. She could bring many patients back to life. But she could not perform surgery on the person she loved the most. She couldn't imagine Aiden's pain and that she could possibly cause more of it. She tried to remain calm, but her mind raced. What if something happened during surgery? What if she made a mistake or there was a complication? She didn't dare to move the scalpel. Usually she was calm under pressure. She was a doctor who could handle the most extreme circumstances. But this wasn't any patient. This was Aiden. She took yet another step back from the operating table and Dr. Kenzie stepped forward. Let me do it, she said. Dr. Turner, you can go out and rest first. Dr. Kenzie signaled to a nurse to help Emma out of the operating theater. In the hall, Chris waited nervously. When he saw Emma leaving with the nurse, he quickly asked why they had left the room. Dr. Turner was shaking so much she could not even hold the scalpel. Dr. Kenzie asked me to send her out. The nurse answered in a low voice. Chris turned to Emma in rage. Emma, what are you doing? Aiden needs you. He needs you to save him. You need to remain calm, he yelled. Emma didn't say anything. She leaned against the wall and took her mask off, silently crying. The nurse turned to Chris. 
It's hard for her to keep calm with a patient this important, he explained. If she's nervous, it's easier to make mistakes. I'm afraid, Emma said quietly. What if there's an accident during surgery? What if my hands shake so much that he is injured? Or that I cut something? I'm so afraid to lose him. The nurse tried to comfort Emma. Dr. Kenzie can handle this. You have coached her. She will save Aiden, he said. Suddenly, Emma stepped away from the wall. She realized that as long as she was outside of the operating room, she would be worried over whatever was going on inside and whether Dr. Kenzie would make a mistake. She needed to be in the room. No, she declared. I can't trust anyone but myself. I need to save my love. I am the chief surgeon, and I know his injury. I need to be there. Are you sure you can do this? Chris asked. I'm sure, Emma said, and she walked back toward the operating room. She took a deep breath. She had to calm down, restrain herself, and not let her imagination run wild. If she was going to worry about others making an error during surgery, she might as well be in the room herself. She washed her hands and re-prepped herself to enter the room, then pushed open the door. The operating theater was silent as Dr. Kenzie operated. As Emma walked toward the table, she couldn't help but call out Aiden's name. She wanted him to suddenly open his eyes and respond, but she knew he would not. She knelt down next to him and whispered into his ear, Aiden, I will operate on you. You will be okay. Emma stood up and said to Dr. Kenzie, I can do it. Dr. Kenzie nodded and handed her the scalpel. Emma took a deep breath. She placed the scalpel on the tray, took another big inhale, and then picked it back up. With a steady hand, she brought the scalpel to Aiden's skin. Emma worked with silent concentration. She focused on her love for Aiden, and she tried to ignore her fears of the pain he would feel when he awoke. Emma was almost done, when suddenly Dr. Kenzie pointed to Emma's mask. What's wrong with your mouth? she asked. Are you bleeding? Emma did not respond. She was almost done. She began to suture Aiden's wound closed, and Dr. Kenzie stepped in. I can finish stitching him up, she said. You need to go check on your mouth. Emma did not acknowledge Dr. Kenzie. She knew that she would not stop moving until the operation was completely done. Only after she was fully finished did she walk away from the table and then direct the nurses to move Aiden to the ICU. Dr. Kenzie joined her as she walked out of the operating theater. How is he? Chris asked as soon as he saw them. Dr. Kenzie replied, the operation was very successful. Chris breathed a sigh of relief. Emma started to walk away to join Aiden in the ICU, but Dr. Kenzie stopped her. Your mouth, she said, gesturing to the blood on Emma's mask. Emma pulled down her mask. Her bottom lip was bleeding. She had been biting down on her lip so harshly as she operated that she had injured herself. My mouth is fine, Emma said, shaking her head. There is no need to treat it. I want to see Aiden. Dr. Kenzie sighed. At least get washed up, and we will try to treat it quickly, she said. After Emma had washed up, Dr. Kenzie helped her clean the wound on her mouth. You may need stitches, Dr. Kenzie said. Emma shook her head again. No, I don't have time for that, she insisted. Dr. Kenzie looked at her and wanted to say something, but stopped. She sighed and helped bandage up the room. The next step was to set up protection for Aiden. She figured that Emma would not leave his side, but they still needed some other assistance. She arranged for four-hour rotations of staff to watch Aiden. Emma refused to leave Aiden's room. She held his hand and stayed directly beside him. For the days after the surgery, Chris was in charge of Wendy. He took her to school and to Emma's parents and to the company when he needed to watch her. When Aiden finally woke up, the first thing he saw was Emma. She was smiling. She had been taking care of all of his vitals and his information and recording every little detail. As soon as she saw him begin to gain consciousness, she started to cry. 
Aiden wanted to raise his hand and wipe her tears, but he could not raise it. Don't cry, he whispered. I won't cry. I have to work, she said, raising a hand to wipe her tears. She diligently began to record his vitals and make sure everything was okay. Aiden smiled as she checked him. He knew that he would be fine in Emma's hands. She was one of the best doctors in the country. Emma did a comprehensive check on Aiden. After confirming that he was fine, she finally relaxed. How do you feel? She asked. Are you dizzy at all? No, Aiden said. He wanted to shake his head but found that he could not move. Don't move your head, Emma exclaimed. She adjusted his pillow and Aiden noticed the wound on her mouth. Mouth, he said. Emma did not realize what he meant. Aiden repeated, Your mouth. Her mouth. Emma touched her mouth and said, It's okay, I just bumped into something. Aiden frowned. He definitely didn't believe her. But Emma had made up her mind that she wasn't going to worry him by telling him what had really happened. Are you thirsty? She asked. You can't drink water yet. I'll rub your lips with cotton balls. Emma brought water to Aiden and used cotton balls to wipe his lips with water. Aiden wouldn't take his eyes off her lips. Why are you always staring? Emma put down the water in her hand and asked. Aiden didn't say anything. Emma smiled and leaned in close to him. I'm fine, she said, and kissed him. Suddenly a sound came from behind her. Emma immediately stood up. Dr. Turner, you still need to take care of your lips for a few days before kissing Aiden. And Aiden's current condition is not suitable for kissing either, Dr. Kenzie said. Emma was embarrassed. She moved away from Aiden's face. Aiden did not say anything. He just raised his hand with difficulty. It took him a lot of effort to hold Emma's hand. The two of them silently gazed into each other's eyes. Dr. Kenzie cleared her throat. <clears> throat> Emma, you haven't eaten. Now that Aiden is up, I think you should try and get some food. You can't go this long without eating, she said. You haven't eaten? Aiden asked worriedly. Emma rolled her eyes. I have, she said to Aiden, lying. Don't worry about me. She turned and glared at Dr. Kenzie. She knew Dr. Kenzie was just looking out for her, but she didn't want to worry Aiden. Go eat. Aiden whispered to her. We'll eat later, Emma said confidently. She didn't want to be anywhere else but by Aiden's side. Aiden noticed her hands trembling, and he squeezed her hand. I can stay with Aiden, Dr. Kenzie insisted. You can quickly pick up whichever meal you want from the cafeteria, and I'll make sure he's okay while you're gone. Emma sighed. She knew that if she didn't eat now, Aiden would probably bring it up again soon. She nodded and let go of Aiden's hand, then walked out of the room. Dr. Kenzie came to sit down in the seat that Emma had left. She looked at Aiden seriously. I'm so happy to see you doing well. This has been so tough for Dr. Turner, she said. Your injury really scared her. Scared her? Aiden asked quietly. Dr. Turner was so scared that she couldn't operate on you at first. She was shaking so much she couldn't hold the scalpel. Dr. Kenzie explained. She left the operating room and then she came back. When she finally operated, she was so focused she bit her lips. Aiden tried to shake his head again. He couldn't hear any more of what Dr. Kenzie was saying. His mind was filled with thoughts of Emma being so concerned she could barely handle her surgery. She was such a strong person, and the thought of her being so upset devastated Aiden. He could not imagine how scared and fragile she was at that time. He wished that he could support her more and take away her pain, but he knew that he needed to recover and to let Emma look after him. Emma returned after about 20 minutes with a to-go bag of food. Dr. Kenzie wished Aiden well and left the room. Emma sat down on the sofa across from Aiden's bed and began to silently eat. Suddenly she stopped when she noticed that he looked distraught. She immediately put down the spoon and walked to his bedside. She nervously touched Aiden's hand and then his head. 
What's wrong? Feeling uncomfortable? Headache? She asked. Aiden lifted his hand to grab Emma's hand. He held it to his mouth and kissed her. I'm fine. Don't be so nervous. I'm sorry. I scared you. I love you. I will protect you and Wendy well in the future. I will also protect myself. When Aiden said this, Emma finally broke down. All of the emotions that she had been trying to hold in to stay strong and stoic came out as she sobbed loudly. She leaned her head on Aiden's shoulder and he hugged her tightly. Thank God you're okay, she whispered. Aiden recovered well. Finally, he was moved from the ICU to another ward. As soon as Chris got the news that he was out of the ICU, he brought Wendy to come see her father. When they arrived, Aiden was sleeping. Wendy stood next to her father, confused. Aiden had a bit of a frown in his sleep, and his forehead was sweating. Mommy, what's wrong with him? Wendy asked. Daddy is hurting because of his wound, Emma said. Wendy replied with an, oh. After a long time, she asked, Mommy, when will Daddy wake up? Emma touched Wendy's head and said, Daddy just fell asleep and will wake up soon. We will wait for Daddy to wake up. About ten minutes later, Aiden woke up with a muffled groan. He was still grimacing, but when he saw Wendy sitting by the bed, he softened his expression. Wendy, you're here, he said brightly. Daddy! Wendy got down from her chair in surprise, but didn't move. Wendy, what's wrong? Come here. Aiden waved at Wendy. Wendy walked to Aiden's bedside and asked carefully, Daddy, do you still feel pain? Daddy doesn't feel pain anymore, Aiden said as he raised his hand and touched Wendy's pink cheeks. Daddy, you're lying. You're still frowning. You're still sweating. You're still in pain, Wendy said. Aiden was stunned for a moment, then smiled. Daddy is fine. It doesn't hurt anymore. Emma sighed and picked Wendy up. She lifted her up so that she could kiss Aiden on the forehead. As she did, Aiden quickly made sure that he smiled and wiped the sweat off his forehead. Thank you, Wendy, he exclaimed when Emma put her back down. Now you've taken away Daddy's pain. Wendy smiled. Emma could tell that Aiden was trying to keep positive for Wendy. Wendy, Uncle Chris is going to come and get you soon, okay? She said. She held Wendy's hand and led her out of the room toward Chris in the hall. After Emma carried Wendy out, Aiden couldn't help but let out a muffled groan. His forehead was covered in sweat and his hands were tightly clutching the bedding. His entire body was trembling due to the pain. When Emma came back into the room, she rushed to his bedside. Are you in pain? She said. No, it's fine. Aiden shook his head. Emma's heart felt like it was being cut by a knife when she saw Aiden like this. But there was nothing she could do except give him more pain medication. She pressed the button near his bed to call for a nurse. Instead, Dr. Kenzie came. We need more pain medication, Emma told her. Dr. Kenzie shook her head. You know we don't want to give him any more, she said. No, I can't watch him suffer so much. I can't. Emma looked at Aiden who was trembling in pain on the bed. Her heart ached so much that she almost broke down. She loved him so much that she could not bear to see him in pain at all. Dr. Kenzie sighed. Emma, you know as well as I do that we don't want Aiden to develop a reliance on the medication. We can wait until tomorrow to give him the next dosage. We only have to wait a little bit of time, she said. Emma nodded. She held Aiden's hand and tried to comfort him. She knew if she couldn't give him the medicine, at least she could try and comfort him with her words. She left his bedside only to take a quick shower and clean up, and then she helped Aiden wash off some of his sweat with a sponge and a basin of water. She slowly and methodically helped clean him off and dry him. Then she began to massage his body, beginning with his legs. While massaging, Emma asked in a low voice, "'Were you in a lot of pain?' Aiden pursed his lips and replied, Yes. When Wendy was here, how did you handle it? She asked. 
I have to look strong for my daughter. Aiden said matter-of-factly. If I had known how much pain you were in, I would have sent Wendy away, Emma said. I know you would not have been able to part with me, Aiden said, smiling. He was right. She couldn't bear to part with him at all. It was too much. After everything, they had been there. Emma put down the bath supplies and carefully laid down on the other half of the bed so that she could be close to Aiden without disrupting any of the tubes and wires that connected him to the monitors and the IVs. They cried together silently, holding each other and reflecting on how grateful they were to be together and safe for the moment, with Wendy cared for and Aiden's recovery headed in the right direction. Aiden recovered rather quickly after he left the ICU. Finally, Emma began to feel comfortable leaving Aiden for longer stretches to return to her work. She would visit patients and perform surgeries, and always return to his bedside at the end of the day. Chris continued to take care of Wendy and bring her to and from school, her grandparents, and the hospital. When Chris visited, Emma watched closely, worried that Chris would begin to ask Aiden about work. She knew that he was feeling a bit bitter and was eager to return to normalcy, but she was also concerned about him pushing himself too hard and setting back his recovery. On one day, Chris brought Wendy to the hospital and was surprised to see that Emma was not in the room. She's not here, he asked in surprise. She's in the operating theater, Aiden said. She started to go back to surgeries. He waved Wendy to come over and sit by him. Wendy eagerly jumped up onto a chair and came to sit next to her father in bed. Are you in pain? Are you thirsty? She asked. Chris smiled. She sounds like her mother more and more, he said. Aiden nodded. Are you going to be a doctor like mommy? He asked her. Wendy giggled and jumped back down from the bed. It was time for her to go leave with Chris. And when she did, she tearfully said goodbye to her father. They made sure to stop by the operating theater and went into the observation room above so she could wave goodbye to her mother. Later, after Wendy and Chris had left, Aiden contacted Chris to ask him to take Wendy to a doctor. He was concerned that the events of the past week had impacted her. She was acting so mature and concerned about him, but he worried about the lasting effects of the incident. Chris took Wendy to a psychiatrist who confirmed that there was some psychological trauma related to the kidnapping. The next time he brought Wendy to see her father, he filled Aiden in on the visit and assured him that the doctor said that Wendy should be okay with time. After they chatted for a bit, Chris left to handle business at the company and he left Wendy with her father. After Chris left, Aiden called Wendy over. Wendy, come here. Daddy, Wendy said, and she obediently walked to his bedside. Aiden touched Wendy's head and said, Come on up to the bed, Wendy. You can give me a hug. No, Daddy is still sick. Wendy shook her head and refused. Daddy is fine. I want to give Wendy a hug, he said as he struggled to sit up. He tried to extend his hand to Wendy. Wendy looked at Aiden but did not say anything. She did not move either. Aiden blinked and asked, Wendy, don't you want to spend time with Daddy? Wendy nodded. She stared at Aiden for a while and then walked a little closer to him so he was able to pick her up carefully and set her on his bed. Wendy, can you tell Daddy a happy little story about the gray wolf? Wendy nodded obediently and told Aiden a story about how the happy sheep was taken away by the wolf and then escaped. After Wendy finished her story, Aiden said, Wendy, the happy sheep always beats the bad guy. Isn't that very smart and powerful? Yes, the happy sheep is the smartest. It isn't afraid of the bad guy, Grey Wolf, she said. Will Wendy be afraid of the bad guy, Aiden asked. Wendy didn't say anything. She just looked at Aiden. Aiden held Wendy in his arms and said, Wendy, the bad guy has been taken by police. Are you still afraid? Wendy lowered her head and thought for a while, then shook her head. 
Aiden's heart ached as he kissed his baby daughter's forehead. Daddy is here. Daddy, they took me away from the kindergarten. They asked me to tell them mommy's phone number. They asked me to call mommy. Wendy cried as she told Aiden what had happened. His heart was boiling with anger when he heard her cries. It's okay. Everything is fine now, he said as he comforted her. Wendy had not been sleeping well. Aiden patted her back, and she seemed to finally relax and fell asleep in the bed with him. When she was resting calmly, Aiden covered her with a blanket and took his phone from the bedside table. He called Chris. Where is Carl Ockham now? The police have him, Chris said. Aiden frowned. Did Lane not respond? He is trying his best to get Ockham back to their city. He has used up all his manpower and resources. He's trying to get everyone possible involved, but it seems it won't work, Chris said. Huh, Aiden replied. He raised his eyebrows. Chris coughed a few times and then said, <clears throat> I just got the latest news. Lane's plan was ruined because of a joint effort between the Doyle, Vincent, and Johansson families. Aiden was a little surprised. I called the Johansson and asked them to treat Ockham well. If you know what I mean. I don't know what happened after that. Chris's voice was light, and it was hard to hide the gloating tone. Once Rex had heard about what happened with Carl Ockham, Wendy, Aiden, and Emma, he had gone into action to make sure that Carl was not allowed out of jail, no matter who his father tried to get involved from the U.S. or from their own country. This was likely going to send Lane into a rage, as he wasn't used to not being able to get his own way. He was humiliated, and he'd likely try to seek revenge somehow. Chris and Aiden knew this was possible. At six o'clock in the evening, Emma finally left the operating theater and came to Aiden's room. She opened the door and began to speak, when Aiden made a gesture to shush her and pointed to Wendy sleeping next to him. Emma walked over quietly and asked in a low voice, When did Wendy come? Chris brought her over this afternoon. He answered in a low voice. Emma nodded. She doesn't usually sleep at this time, she said. Where's Chris? Why didn't he take her home? I asked him to leave her here with me. Aiden replied. Emma stared at Aiden for a long time before asking, Do you want Wendy to stay in the hospital with you? Aiden didn't answer her question. Instead, he said, It's not convenient for Chris to go back and forth. Plus, Wendy is happier with us. Emma didn't want Wendy to stay in the hospital instead of her room at her grandparents. But she knew that Aiden had a point. Wendy had been away from her parents for a while. Okay, she said. I can arrange for a nurse to come help with her. No need. I can take care of her. Aiden replied. Emma sighed. Well, maybe I will just make sure that we have others coming to stop in every now and then. Aiden nodded. After all, he couldn't get out of bed yet. It made sense that they would need some additional help. Emma checked Aiden's vitals and then went to take a shower. When she came back, Wendy woke up. Daddy? Wendy rubbed her big sleepy eyes and called to Aiden. Aiden pointed behind Wendy. Wendy, look over there. Wendy's eyes were wide open. When she turned around, she saw Emma standing there. Mommy! Wendy, you're awake! Emma walked over with a smile. Yes, Wendy nodded. Emma picked Wendy up from the bed. You must be hungry. What do you want to eat? We'll go to dinner. What about Daddy? Wendy asked. Let's go eat together and then we'll bring it back to Daddy, Emma replied. Wendy shook her head. I want to eat with Daddy. Sure, eat with your Daddy, Emma said helplessly. Daddy, what do you want to eat? Wendy will bring it back for you, Wendy asked him. Daddy can just eat porridge right now, Emma said. We can bring it back to him. Wendy was obviously not satisfied with Emma's answer. She looked at Aiden. Aiden nodded. Yes. Daddy can only drink porridge. Wendy nodded seriously. 
Daddy, I will bring you porridge, then we will have dinner. Emma did not know whether to laugh or cry. Wendy only wanted to listen to her father now. But Wendy hugged Emma's neck and kissed her on the side of her face. And Emma smiled again. All right, we're going out to buy food. Say goodbye to Daddy, Emma said. Wendy waved goodbye, and Aiden watched as Emma carried her away. He was about to close his eyes and rest a bit longer when his phone rang. It was an unfamiliar number. Confused, he pressed the answer button. Mrs. Vincent's voice came from the other side. Is this Aiden? Aiden's fingers trembled as he held the phone. Yes. I heard from Rex that you are injured. Are you okay? Mrs. Vincent didn't let Aiden answer before she continued. I heard you and Emma were in trouble. Why didn't you call us? We're okay. Nothing much happened, Aiden said. What do you mean, nothing much? Mrs. Vincent exclaimed. Her voice rose. Wendy and Emma were kidnapped and injured? That's a big deal. Not to mention Carl Ockham. He's a huge risk. He shouldn't dare bully my family. Aiden couldn't help but feel warm in his heart when he heard Mrs. Vincent say, Family. Thank you for being so concerned about us, he said. Why are you thanking me? She responded. You are family. She went on to ask Aiden details about his recovery. Finally, when they were about to say goodbye, Mrs. Vincent mentioned that she was going to come to visit. Aiden immediately said, You guys are all so busy, don't come over. I'm fine. Why can't I come to see you? Mrs. Vincent said. Okay then, Aiden replied. He knew he probably couldn't convince her otherwise. But don't tell Grandpa, okay? If he comes here, he might get sick again. Ha! Huh, Mrs. Vincent replied. Do you think we would tell him? If he knew your phone would have exploded long ago, he'd be contacting all the time to check up on you. Don't worry, he doesn't know. I'll let you rest, Mrs. Vincent said. And then they said their goodbyes. In the evening, Emma returned with Wendy. Are you hungry? She asked her father. Aiden shook his head and looked at the baby. What porridge did you bring for Daddy? Daddy, it's your favorite porridge, she said. And she raised the small bag in her hand high, as if she was presenting a treasure. Thank you, Wendy, Aiden said with a smile. Wendy, come bring Daddy's porridge to me, Emma said. Wendy brought the porridge to her father, and then Emma prepared the meal on a small tray to bring to Aiden. She brought it over to him, and then gestured for Wendy to come sit on the sofa and eat with her. But Wendy refused. I want to eat with Daddy. Emma was stunned. Then she smiled and said, Wendy, we are eating with Daddy. No. Wendy sat down on the chair next to Aiden's bed and crossed her arms. Emma frowned. Just as she was about to scold Wendy, Aiden spoke up. You can lift Wendy up and she can eat on my bed with me. Wendy's eyes immediately lit up when Aiden said that. Emma was at her wit's end. Following Aiden's instructions, she carried Wendy to Aiden's bed and sat her dinner on the small tray next to Aiden's. Aiden and Wendy chatted happily as they ate, and Emma sat alone on the sofa, a little jealous of the two of them. After dinner, Emma helped Aiden wash up and change his clothes, and then she took Wendy to get changed and dressed and ready for bed. Wendy wanted to sleep in bed with Aiden, but Emma convinced her that she needed to let her father rest and recover. Instead, they had a small cot set up next to his bed. Wendy agreed to sleep in there, and she quickly drifted off. But after Emma and Aiden also fell asleep, they were awoken in the middle of the night by Wendy's screams. Emma turned on the bedside lamp and saw Wendy crying. Wendy, what's wrong? Ooh, ooh, Daddy? Mommy? Wendy seemed to be dreaming about finding Emma and Aiden. Aiden tried to get up to comfort her. She has nightmares, he said. Emma gestured for him to lie back down. No, no, she said. I'll comfort her. You need to rest. Emma picked her up and began to rock her back and forth. Eventually, she quieted down and fell back into a calm sleep. 
She's having nightmares because of the kidnapping. Aiden said sadly. It's affecting her more than we realized. Emma's face fell. It's all my fault. It's my fault that I didn't protect her well. She began to weep. Aiden shook his head. Of course, it's not your fault. But Emma continued to cry. It is my fault. I was angry with you and I didn't call you back. Emma said sadly. Aiden suddenly broke down. He had tried to remain stoic for Emma, given everything she was dealing with. But now he began to cry as well. It's all my fault. I'm the one who put you in danger. And put Wendy in danger too, he said hoarsely. He was angry at himself for provoking Carl and for getting his love and his daughter involved. He was angry that he didn't feel like he had protected them well. Emma hugged him. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for you and I'm so sorry for Wendy, he continued. Wendy will be fine, she replied. You just need to hurry up and recover, okay? And then we can work together to help Wendy. We can do it. Emma's comforting words began to help Aiden calm down. He nodded. That night, neither of them slept. They just watched Wendy, and they were both happy to see that she did not have any other nightmares. The next morning, Emma had an early meeting. She got up before dawn and tidied the room, then prepared for a day of work. Aiden stopped her and said worriedly, Why don't you rest today? You didn't sleep the whole night. I'm fine, she said. Go back to sleep. After the meeting, I'll come back and take care of Wendy. Aiden knew that he could not change Emma's mind. After she left, he couldn't go back to sleep. Instead, he watched Wendy. About an hour later, Emma returned. Why aren't you sleeping? She asked him. You need to rest so you can recover quickly. Aiden agreed to close his eyes and went back to sleep. When Wendy woke up, Emma helped her get dressed and ready for the day. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. It's so early, who would be here? Emma muttered. She picked up Wendy from the bed and set her on the ground and then opened the door. She found Mrs. Vincent and Jensen standing at the door with guards. She couldn't believe it. She was afraid of worrying them, so she had not told them about everything that had occurred. She was speechless in front of them. You too! Why didn't you call us? What if something truly terrible had happened? Mrs. Vincent exclaimed. Emma lowered her head. I didn't want to worry you, she said. We are family. It is only right to be worried. Where is Aiden? How are you? How is Wendy? Mrs. Vincent replied. Wendy and I are fine. Aiden just fell back asleep. Mrs. Vincent lowered her voice. How is Aiden? How was he hurt? Rex did not tell us all the details. He had a fracture in his skull, but the surgery went well, and he wasn't in the ICU for too long. He's recovering okay, Emma explained. Mrs. Vincent and Jensen were both shocked to hear the severity of his injuries. We didn't realize it was that serious, Mrs. Vincent said. Emma frowned. It's all my fault. He was injured trying to save me. Mrs. Vincent shook her head in reply, It's not your fault, nor his. It was natural for him to try and save you. If he let you get hurt, then we'd have to blame him for not protecting you well enough, she said softly, putting a hand on Emma's shoulder. Hearing Mrs. Vincent's words, Emma's heart was still conflicted, but she began to feel better. She invited the two of them into the room to take a seat. To their surprise, Aiden had already awoken. He tried to sit up to greet them, but Mrs. Vincent and Jensen urged him to rest. They sat down on the sofa, and Emma brought another pillow to prop up behind Aiden's back. Wendy saw what her mother was doing and copied her, bringing a pillow from her own bed to try and make her father more comfortable. Mrs. Vincent saw Wendy's actions and laughed. Look at how sensible she is. Aiden nodded and put a hand on Wendy's head. Emma finished getting Wendy ready and said she would go to fetch breakfast for all of them. So she left Mrs. Vincent and Jensen to talk with Aiden privately. Carl's trial will be in about a month. It's predicted that the sentencing would be 20 years. I want to know what you think, 
Jensen said. Twenty years, Aiden asked. He frowned. I can take care of him in other ways, he said ominously. Jensen stared at Aiden, then nodded. All right, I will arrange it. You can let me know when the time comes. Thank you, uncle. Aiden said. He had never called him uncle before. You could tell by Jensen's response that this was exciting to him. I hope you continue to recover as quickly as you have, he said. Your grandfather can't stop talking about you. When you are ready, he would love to have you visit in D.C. Aiden nodded. Okay, when the time comes, I'll bring Emma and Wendy too to come and see him. Wendy and Emma returned with a ton of groceries for everyone, and they began to set up breakfast. After breakfast, Emma was asking Mrs. Vincent and Jensen about where they were staying in New York when there was another knock on the door. Emma was dumbfounded. She opened the door to find John and Nancy. What are you doing here? She asked. We've waited long enough to visit Aiden since he's been here. Nancy said with irritation. No need to scold, John said. We're here. They gestured to the two guards who were outside the door on either side, who had accompanied Mrs. Vincent and Jensen. Who are they for? John asked. Aiden's aunt and uncle are here, Emma said. You both seem tired. I know you want to see Aiden, but why don't you go and rest for a bit and then come back for lunch? His aunt and uncle? Well, those are our in-laws. How can we not meet them now? John insisted. Emma rolled her eyes. Why don't we wait to all get together another day when we have more time, she said. Why not today? John insisted. And he walked past her into the room. Emma groaned and put her hands on her head. Aiden was startled to see Nancy and John in his hospital room. How is your recovery? Nancy asked. She looked Aiden up and down. Does your head still hurt? How are you feeling? Emma won't respond to us. She hasn't been updating us well at all, she scolded. Don't blame Emma. She's been so busy with me and with work. If you want to blame anyone, blame me, Aiden said. Nancy was annoyed. You don't need to defend her. She has a responsibility to contact her parents as well, she said. Aiden reached out to hold Emma's hand. She has worked so hard through. She's been taking care of me so well. And Wendy. Mrs. Vincent couldn't help but chime in. You can tell how this has all taken a toll on her. She is so tired and is not eating enough. Nancy smiled at Mrs. Vincent. She had been irritated at her daughter's silence, but she knew there was no fussing about it any longer. She sat down on the sofa with Mrs. Vincent, and the two of them began to chat. Almost instantly, they were laughing and talking comfortably as if they had known each other for years. Jensen and John looked on awkwardly. Jensen immediately recognized John when he entered, but he had not realized he was Aiden's father-in-law until this moment. The two of them also sat down in the room to discuss. In another setting, they may talk politics and planning, but for now, their concern was Aiden. So I hear you are just in town to check in on him, John said. Yes, it's not usual for him to agree to take any help, but we wanted to come and see him in person, Jensen replied. John was not surprised at all. Sounds like Aiden. It has always been his style to take care of things himself, he said. I've taken a liking to him. I'm glad he wasn't raised to be a successor to the Doyle family. Jensen felt bitter when he heard John's words. He figured that John meant that Aiden could be a successor to the Turners. Jensen considered that if he had been raised with his mother's family, he could be a Doyle instead. Emma had been worried about her parents meeting Jensen and Mrs. Vincent, but the scene in front of her put her at ease. Everyone seemed to be getting along better than she expected. She turned to Aiden, smiling widely. He made room in the bed so that she could sit with him and Wendy. They kept talking and chatting so long that they had lunch ordered to the room. Everyone socialized until Jensen and Mrs. Vincent announced that they needed to get back to D.C. for some business. 
After they left, Nancy and John insisted that Wendy come back with them to the house, instead of staying at the hospital. Emma agreed to walk them out of the hospital with Wendy, but she kept insisting that Wendy stay with her. She thought that it was best for Wendy to be with her parents. That's not going to work. Aiden needs you, and Wendy needs you, and you have to work. How can you do all that? Plus, I can bring Wendy to see you as much as you need, Nancy said. I can bring her three times a day. No, no, she needs to stay with us. She's behaving well, and she can handle being in the room with her father. She's been here already, and she's doing okay, Emma replied. Nancy saw that persuading Emma was ineffective. She turned to Wendy and said, Wendy, you can come with Grandma and Grandpa. We'll come back to see Daddy tomorrow, okay? Wendy did not say anything and just hid behind Emma. Nancy was about to say something when John said, Let Wendy stay. How can Emma and Aiden take care of her in this situation? Emma has to work and care for Aiden, Nancy said. John didn't answer his wife. Instead, he said to Emma, Make sure that you're taking good care of them and yourself. It's cold out here. Take Wendy back inside. Emma nodded and said goodbye to her parents. After they left, Wendy and Emma went back into the hospital. Why didn't you tell her to let us keep Wendy? Isn't she tired enough? Nancy asked her husband. Have you noticed how Wendy is acting? I think she needs to be around her parents, he replied. Nancy was silent for a moment and then nodded. I know it's a lot of work for her, but I'm worried about Wendy, John continued. I think it's best if she is with her parents right now. Emma and Wendy returned to Aiden's room. Emma was exhausted, but she needed to do her rounds for the evening. Can you find someone else to do the rounds for you? Aiden asked. Emma shook her head. She knew that in the time it would take to page someone else and fill them in on her patients, she could probably already be done. She got Wendy washed and dressed for bed, then put on her doctor's coat and did her rounds. When she finished, she returned back to Aiden's room, where Wendy was already sleeping. Lane was fuming when he heard the news that his son had been detained overseas. He had tried to use all of his connections in the government and beyond to negotiate for his son's release. But Aiden, like the Ockham family, was a high-profile individual. Attacking a man like him and his daughter and lover was not going to be forgiven easily by the most powerful families in the city. The legal system, which Lane knew could be bribed and bought, was not going to be easily swayed in this situation. When Lane's assistant updated him on the most recent news about Carl's court proceedings, he knew that his next best bargaining chip would be financial, and to try to get Aiden and Emma to withdraw charges against his son. There would still be charges for Carl's crimes, but if Aiden wasn't as adamant about Carl's imprisonment, there may be some way to get him out of the country quickly and under the radar. He asked his staff to look into the weak points of SG Enterprises and their associates, but the results were disappointing. SG Enterprises had prepared for any sort of attack from SA Company, and it would be difficult for Lane to make any sort of progress against them. Lane raged around his office. He couldn't believe that he was being foiled in so many different ways. It didn't seem possible. He screamed all day and threw paper and plants in his office, leaving his staff cowering under their desks and behind doors. Attack them from all directions, he shouted. I want to see how long they can hold on for. But his assistant began to say, but Lane immediately silenced him. Don't give me any butts. Get to work. The next time Chris came to Aiden's room, he did so with a whole shopping bag full of snacks. He called out for Wendy when he arrived to help him carry the treats to Aiden. Wendy is looking much better, he told Aiden. He put his hand on Wendy's head. Aiden nodded. What are the updates? What has Lane done? Well, he hasn't done much of anything, Chris said laughing. He was trying to attack us via companies that were associated with SG Enterprises, but we had already cleared out the money. 
We're at least two steps ahead of him, if not more. He's tried nearly everything he can with politics, but his connections aren't getting him anywhere. Aiden glanced at him and asked, Did you trick him? I didn't even need to mess with him. The assets he kept trying to target weren't worth anything anyway, he said. He is very angry, though. He'll seek to destroy SG Enterprises any way he can, Chris said. Aiden rolled his eyes. Have we considered what happens if he teams up with Watt? Aiden asked. If the two of them join forces, then it's another situation. You may actually need to prepare for that. Well, then if that happens, we defeat SA Company, Chris said seriously. He was confident in the strength of SG Enterprises. Aiden nodded. You're right. We'll use the opportunity to end them. Chris knew Aiden well, and he could often pick up on whatever Aiden was thinking before he even did. He knew that Aiden's long game was to destroy SA Company. It was the type of plan that Aiden didn't need to say out loud. Chris just knew what he intended. They weren't going to stop at just hurting the SA Company. They were going to destroy them. After some more business chat, the two relaxed and began to joke around. They were laughing when Emma came into the room. What are you two so happy about? Emma asked curiously. She was suspicious. Why were the two of them smiling like this? Just something that happened to Chris while he was shopping for food, Aiden said. Are you done with work? I just finished. Emma took off her white coat and asked, What happened to Chris when he was shopping? I want to hear. Aiden and Chris were both stunned when Emma asked. They didn't want Emma to know that they had been discussing work. She'd even warned Chris that if she saw a document in the hospital, she'd make sure it was a long time before Aiden was cleared to go back to work. Aiden had been trying to cover up their conversation by telling a story about Chris shopping for snacks, but now she seemed to want to hear about his excuse. Emma crossed her arms over her chest and looked at them. What is it then? I'll let Chris tell you the story, Aiden said, shifting the responsibility to him. Chris thought for a moment. He tried to think of a good excuse, but he knew he wouldn't be able to lie in time. Uh, I'm running late for a meeting, he said. I'll have to tell you the story later. Chris left the room quickly, without saying any more. Emma just stared at Aiden and did not speak. The silence made him nervous. He knew he could not tell Emma what they were talking about. He decided to change the subject and tell Emma about another story about Chris he had discovered recently. Do you know what Chris's big hobby is now? He asked Emma. She originally wanted to ignore Aiden, but she really was curious, so she could not help but ask, What is it? He's buying storehouses, Aiden said. He had discovered this by accident a few months ago. Chris had stepped out, so Aiden decided to handle the mail himself one afternoon. But he realized only after opening one letter that it was not actually for himself, but for Chris. And it included the receipts to a storehouse worth nearly $750,000. Aiden couldn't imagine what Chris was buying that space for. Emma laughed. What could he possibly be buying that for? Is that true? Why would I lie about that? Aiden said, smiling. I don't know what he's up to, but that purchase seems to mean he's collecting something. That's what I was just laughing about with him. No wonder he was so embarrassed and left so quickly, Emma remarked. Please don't say anything to Chris, Aiden asked. He'd be terribly embarrassed. Emma nodded and laughed. She noticed that Wendy was happily counting the snacks in the shopping bag that Chris had bought for her. It was the first time that Wendy had been interested in anything besides her father or mother since the kidnapping. Chris brought those for her, Aiden said when he noticed Emma watching, and when he was here, he touched her head and she didn't flinch. So it seems like Dr. Tally's method is effective, Emma said happily. After Wendy's second nightmare in the hospital, Emma had contacted Dr. Tally, 
a doctor she knew who worked with children, and Dr. Tally had recommended that Wendy spend a lot of time with her parents, and then slowly begin to interact with people who were on good terms with her family. Wendy's reaction to Chris was a good sign. Wendy was also more open to her grandparents when they visited. It had been hard for her to leave her parents at all now that she was staying at the hospital, but gradually she was improving. Once Aiden was well enough to get out of bed, he was eager to go home. But Emma did not allow him to walk around too much. She was still nervous about his recovery. His wound was looking better, but she didn't want him to try to get back to normal too quickly. Aiden was getting sick of being in the hospital and the monotony of his room. Emma agreed to put him in a wheelchair to get outside and enjoy some nice weather. She prepared Aiden and Wendy, and they left the room to go out to the garden. Along the way, nearly every nurse and doctor they saw wanted to stop them to say hi. Aiden knew that Emma was popular in the hospital, as she was bound to be because she was the director, but he didn't realize how many people would want to stop and talk to them. What a wonderful doctor you are, remarked one of the nurses. Your patients are lucky that you are willing to take them out to see the sun. When Aiden heard this, he scowled. Emma couldn't see his face, so she continued pushing him out to the garden. When they finally got outside, they found a spot to relax in the sun. Are you okay? Are you comfortable? She asked. It's okay, Aiden replied expressionlessly. Emma looked at Aiden strangely. Why was he unhappy suddenly? She reached out to touch Aiden's forehead. What's wrong? Are you uncomfortable? She was already so worried, so how could Aiden be angry anymore? He raised his hand to hold Emma's hand that covered his forehead and said in a low voice, I'm not your patient. I'm your man. He deliberately emphasized the word, man. Emma was stunned for a few seconds before she realized that Aiden was angry because of what the nurse said. She just said it casually, Emma replied. But you didn't explain. Aiden knew he was being dramatic, but he wasn't happy. He didn't want to just be seen as Emma's patient. Emma smiled when she heard Aiden's words. Do you need me to explain to everyone that you are not my patient, but my man? Aiden was stunned for a moment and did not say anything. She leaned close to his ear and whispered, Our relationship does not need to be explained to others, because no one, or anything, will change our relationship. Aiden held Emma's hand and apologized. I'm sorry, I was being unreasonable. Emma just said to Wendy, Wendy, do you think Daddy is acting childish? Yes, Daddy is very childish, Wendy said to Aiden seriously. Oh, well, if Wendy thinks you're being childish, then you must be, Emma said, and then they both laughed. Aiden looked at the mother and daughter who were smiling under the sunlight, and his heart was at peace. Emma pushed Aiden for a few minutes down the path, and then stopped. How's this spot, she asked. Anywhere is perfect with you by my side, Aiden said. He looked up at her smiling. Emma knew she needed to leave soon for work, and she began to feel a little guilty. I'm sorry I've been working so much, she said. I'm going to need to get back to my patient soon today. You have already done so much, Aiden said. It is the greatest fortune of my life to have you. You are so good that I am worried someone will come and snatch you from me. Aiden's eyes were full of love. Emma did not know whether to laugh or cry when she heard Aiden's words. Who do you think people will come and snatch me from? You, she said. Many people would fight to have you, Aiden said. He was overcome with jealousy, but he knew it would not be worth getting into that conversation with Emma now. Emma was looking at Aiden strangely when her phone rang. It was Dr. Kenzie on the line saying that a surgery in progress needed help. Okay, I'll come over right away, Emma said. And then she hung up the phone. I'm going to the operating room, she told Aiden. I'll take you back to the room first. Aiden shook his head and refused. Go ahead and do what you need to do, 
Don't worry about me. How are you going to get back? She asked. Aiden smiled. I can figure it out. It's your hospital, isn't it? Emma nodded. Well, if you need anything, just call. And don't stay outside too long. My mom will be back with lunch at 11 o'clock. She turned to Wendy. Wendy, look after your daddy. If you need anything, you can ask them to call your grandma and grandpa, okay? Wendy nodded obediently. Mommy, I will take good care of daddy. Emma kissed Wendy on the forehead. Be good, Wendy. After kissing Wendy, Emma prepared to go to the operating theater. What about my kiss? Aiden asked suggestively. Emma blushed. Not here. Back at the room you can get a kiss, she said. A bright smile appeared on Aiden's face. Then I'll wait. Emma was in a hurry to go to the operating theater. She did not think too much about what Aiden said about waiting for the kiss. After Emma left, Wendy followed Emma's instructions and kept watch over her father. She kept asking him questions to make sure he was comfortable. Daddy, are you thirsty? Do you want some water? She asked. Daddy, the sun isn't high here. Do you want to go somewhere else? Aiden didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Baby, go and play. Look, your favorite flowers are over there. Aiden pointed at the flowers in the garden. Wendy looked in at the flower bed and then looked back at Aiden. But mommy told me to look after you. Aiden touched her head. It's okay. Go look at the flowers. Daddy will call you if there's anything. No, I need to stay with you, she replied stubbornly. But don't you like the flowers? Aiden asked. I do, but I need to stay with Daddy. Well, Wendy, can you push Daddy to the flower bed? Wendy nodded obediently and pushed Aiden to the front of the flower bed. Inside the hospital, Dr. Yan walked past the windows that overlooked the courtyard in the small garden. He spotted two figures, one small and one larger. He recognized Wendy before he spotted Aiden. He didn't expect to see either of them there. He looked to see if Emma was nearby, but he didn't see her. Then he noticed that Aiden had wrapping around his head, and he was in a wheelchair. Was he injured? Dr. Yan got the attention of the nurse who was accompanying him. That person, is he? The nurse smiled at him. Dr. Yan knew that she couldn't tell him much about Aiden's condition because of hospital policy, but he was clear that he was injured. What had happened? Dr. Yan walked out of the doors towards Aiden. How are you? He asked. Was there an accident? Aiden shrugged. He wasn't in the mood to be polite with Dr. Yan. How's your recovery? Aiden nodded and didn't say anything. Dr. Yan and Aiden had known each other for many years, but that was just because of Emma. Dr. Yan also knew that Aiden didn't like him very much. The situation was becoming awkward. Well, I need to go now to meet Benny to talk about my lessons in the hospital, Dr. Yan said. Benny. Aiden repeated curiously. He thought that Emma oversaw Dr. Yan's work in the hospital. Benny is in charge of my teaching. Emma handed over the responsibility to him. Dr. Yan continued. Dr. Yan was walking away when Aiden felt his phone vibrate in his pocket. It was Nancy. He saw that it was already 11 o'clock. He must be late for lunch. Are you at an appointment? Where are you? And where is Emma? Nancy asked when Aiden answered the line. Emma went into an operation, Aiden said. Nancy raised her voice. Then where are you? Wendy and I are in the yard. We will be back soon, he said. You haven't recovered yet. Why are you running around? I'll ask John to go get you, Nancy said. No need. We can go back by ourselves, Aiden quickly replied. Don't move. John is already on his way, Nancy said, and she hung up the phone before Aiden could respond. Aiden stared at his phone helpless. He called Wendy over to his side. John approached them from the same walkway that Dr. Yan had taken, and he frowned when he saw Wendy pushing Aiden. Didn't Nancy say you should just wait here for me, he said. Wendy is here to help me, and it's not far. 
Aiden replied, Yes, our little Wendy is a little adult. John's expression was gentle. He squatted down and opened his hands to Wendy. Wendy and Daddy are going back to eat. John picked up Wendy and then walked toward the room with Aiden, who was controlling the wheelchair. Dr. Yan watched from the end of the corridor as they passed. He was waiting for Benny so he didn't expect to see Aiden and Wendy again. He was lost in his thoughts when the nurse tried to get his attention. Dr. Yan finally came back to his senses. Huh? The nurse looked in the direction Aiden and the others had walked and asked with a smile. Do you know him? And the director of the hospital? Dr. Yan nodded. Every day, Nancy packed a lunch to bring to the hospital in person or to have delivered. Aiden knew that Nancy and John had good intentions, but he didn't feel like they needed to prepare food every day. He had told Emma this, but she said that they insisted. Nancy spent much of lunch concerned over Aiden's recovery and distraught that he had gone outside with Wendy. Aiden nodded dutifully as she fretted. After they finished eating, Nancy and John left, and Wendy took her afternoon nap. Aiden laid in bed and began to review the documents that Chris had sent over to him the day before. He was afraid Emma would see that he was taking on work again, so he had hidden them in the drawer next to his bed. Just as he flipped a few pages, the familiar sound of high heels came from outside. It was Emma. Of course, he could tell the sound of her high heels, given how many times he had waited for their return, morning and night. Aiden quickly stuffed the documents back in the drawer. How was lunch? Emma asked. It was fine, but I'd prefer some beef and pork ribs and maybe mac and cheese too, Aiden said. Emma laughed. That's all way too heavy for you right now. You need to continue to take it easy. When we leave the hospital, I'll make a big feast for you. And you can eat whatever you want, okay? Emma said. Aiden nodded. She opened the lunchbox on the coffee table and asked, How long did you stay in the yard today? Not long, Aiden replied. He watched Emma eat her meal. Did you ask Benny to handle Dr. Yan's teaching? He asked. Yes. Emma took another bite and asked casually, How did you know? I saw him in the yard this morning, and he told me. What a coincidence, Emma replied. Aiden wanted to ask Emma whether she asked Benny to handle Dr. Yan because of him, but it didn't seem to be worth the discussion. After Emma ate lunch, she tidied up the room. I have an operation in the afternoon, so I may not be back till after, she said. She said goodbye and headed back to work. In the afternoon, Emma got a call from the director of North Central Bronx Hospital about a patient who needed assistance. It was an emergency surgery and they didn't have any surgeons with Emma's expertise. Emma was reluctant to go at first, but the director insisted that they needed her help and explain the situation. She left so quickly that she was not able to send word to Aiden about where she had gone. At dinner, Aiden waited for Emma, but she did not show up. He called her a few times, but she didn't pick up. It was getting late, and Wendy was exhausted. Finally, he called a nurse on duty to ask about her, and the nurse told him that Emma was at North Central Bronx for surgery. He asked the nurse to help him get Wendy ready for sleep, because there was only so much he could do if he was unable to get out of the bed. When Emma returned later in the night, she found Wendy and Aiden both asleep in bed. She stood at the foot of the bed, and stared at them for a bit, until Aiden suddenly awoke. You're back, he asked. The nurse said that you had an emergency surgery at North Central Bronx. Emma nodded. She was exhausted. She took a change of clothes from the cabinet and walked to the bathroom to shower and get dressed for bed. Aiden pulled himself up in bed so he was sitting, and then leaned against the headboard and watched her walk away. After a while, Emma came out of the bathroom. She was showered and changed. When she saw Aiden leaning against the bed, she was stunned for a moment to see him still awake. Then she asked, Why aren't you asleep yet? I'm waiting for you to follow through on your promise from earlier in the day. Huh? It took Emma a few seconds to realize what Aiden was talking about. Earlier that day in the courtyard, 
She had said she would kiss him in the room, so now he had stayed up to make sure that she followed through. Emma walked over with a smile, and then leaned over and kissed Aiden's forehead. All right, there's your kiss. Now you can go to sleep. I waited all day just for a kiss on the forehead, Aiden asked. He raised his eyebrows. Well, this is the hospital, and Wendy is in your bed, Emma said. You can move Wendy to the cot next to me so you can be closer, Aiden said. Emma shook her head. When she did, Aiden made a move to get out of bed. She shouted in shock, No, no, don't move! She rolled her eyes and picked Wendy up and moved her to the little cot next to them so Emma could crawl into bed with Aiden. In their eyes, there was nothing but each other. Although they were very tired, Emma woke up before sunrise the next day. Aiden looked sleepily at the bright sky outside the window. Why are you up so early? He asked. Go back to sleep. I'll tidy up. Emma replied as she put on her clothes. Aiden glanced at the messy ward and did not say anything. Emma tidied up the clothes on the floor and opened the window to let some fresh air in. She helped Aiden wash up a bit and then change into new clothes, and then started to clean out the cabinet and the drawers after Aiden fell asleep. She was looking through the drawers when she found the business documents that Aiden had hid. She stared at them for a moment and then frowned and tossed them onto Aiden's bed and left the room. When Aiden awoke, he saw the documents on his bed and knew that something was wrong. Emma had discovered them. What should he do? He thought about waiting for Emma to come back to apologize to her. He promised her that he would not touch the documents while he was in the hospital. But all morning Emma did not appear. Usually she tried to check in for a medication update and his vitals check when she wasn't too busy. But today Dr. Kenzie stopped by instead. Dr. Kenzie, where's Emma? Aiden asked. She's in the operating theater, she replied. It's a nice day as well. Do you want to go to the courtyard again? Aiden shook his head. He wanted to wait in the room until Emma came back so he could talk to her. Well, is it okay then that I take Wendy with me to play? Dr. Kenzie asked. Aiden asked Wendy if she wanted to go play, and when she agreed, he let her leave with Dr. Kenzie. After the two of them left, Aiden called Emma. She didn't answer. He got more and more restless. Finally, he pulled himself into his wheelchair. He was going to find Emma himself. In the hall, he saw Dr. Kenzie and a group of doctors performing their rounds. Dr. Kenzie spotted him and walked over. Wendy is with Dr. Turner now, she explained. So Emma had Wendy now, but had not come back to check on him? Was she angry with him? Aiden pursed his lips and replied coldly, Take me there. Aiden, this may not be a good time, Dr. Kenzie said. Take me there. This time, Aiden's tone was much sharper than before. Dr. Kenzie winced at his tone. She nodded obediently and left instructions for the doctors to finish the rounds. She brought Aiden to Emma's office. The door was shut, but there was a light coming out through the gap between the door and the floor. Dr. Kenzie raised her hand and knocked on the door. Emma's voice came from inside. Come in. Dr. Kenzie hesitated for a moment and pushed open the door and walked in. Emma and Wendy were laughing happily in the office. Dr. Turner Aiden is here? Emma's smile froze on her face. Then she turned around and met Aiden's gaze at the door of the office. She was stunned for a moment. Then she said to Dr. Kenzie, Can you take Wendy to play for a little bit? Dr. Kenzie nodded and brought Wendy out of Emma's office. After a long silence, Aiden spoke first. I came to apologize to you. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you. I asked Chris to bring those documents. Emma did not say anything. She just stood there quietly. She was angry, 
She was angry that Aiden cared about those jobs while he was still in the hospital. She was angry that Aiden did not care about his own body and his own recovery. When she saw him, she felt her anger dissipate. But she knew that she was not going to let this pass easily. She wanted him to remember that he had disappointed her and that he was compromising his recovery. Emma's silent response made Aiden flustered. He hurriedly said, I know I've disappointed you. Don't be unhappy, and please don't ignore me. I was wrong. Emma, don't be angry. Aiden tried to get up from the wheelchair to hug Emma, but he got up too quickly. The world spun and he fell into Emma's body, knocking her back a few steps. She grabbed onto him. Are you okay? Does it hurt? She asked hurriedly. Aiden did not answer Emma's words. He only held her waist tightly, as if he was worried that she would leave. Please, I know I was wrong. Don't ignore me. Emma sighed. Please, Aiden, you know you're not supposed to be working. It's not healthy for you. And don't try to be sneaky. Now I know to keep a closer eye on what Chris is bringing to the hospital. Aiden nodded. Emma was silent for a moment and then said, Okay, you need to go back to the room. Aren't you going back with me? Aiden asked. I need to work. Remember to bring Wendy back, Emma said. When Aiden returned to the room, he made sure to tell Chris not to bring any more documents while he was hospitalized. Ten days later, it was the time for a final check on Aiden. He had been in the hospital for a month. It was determined that he was ready for discharge, but he would need to continue to recuperate at home. On the day that Aiden was discharged, Emma had the day off, and John and Nancy came to help them make the journey. After packing up, they walked out of the hospital together. Outside, the sun was bright and the sky was clear. Aiden, who had been cooped up for the whole month, took a deep breath of this fresh air. He felt like he was covered in mold. Nancy wanted Aiden and Wendy to go back to their house, but Aiden wanted to return to his own apartment. They both turned to Emma to make the final decision. Mom, let's go back to the apartment. Now that he's more stable, he would do well there, and I can check in on him, she said. Okay, Nancy nodded and then said, then I will go and clean up for you guys. No need. I already had a cleaner come in, Emma replied. Chris had arranged everything for their arrival the week before. All right, then call me if you need anything, or if you want to eat, I'll send it to you, Nancy said. Aiden thanked her. It was clear how much she cared for her son-in-law. They said goodbye to Nancy and John, and then drove back home in Lee's car. The apartment was cleaned, and Emma unpacked the bags while Aiden and Wendy watched television. In the refrigerator, she found that almost everything, even the meals made by her mother right after the accident, had gone bad. She quickly threw it all out. She got her bag and coat to go to the grocery store. Where are you going? Aiden asked. We need some groceries, she replied. I'll come with you, he said. Emma shook her head. There's too many people there. What if someone bumps into you and injures you? What if you get hurt again? And what about Wendy? Aiden sighed. He could try to argue that he was okay to leave and be in the crowded supermarket. But he couldn't argue against her point about Wendy. If they both went and brought Wendy, it would be more for Emma to handle. Okay then, let Lee drive you, he said. Emma rolled her eyes. It's one block away. I don't need a car. Well then, let Lee come to help you carry things, he insisted. I can carry it myself, Emma replied. Aiden was about to say something else when the doorbell rang. Emma opened the door to find Randy. He was supposed to be out of the country working in business development, so both Emma and Aiden were surprised to see him. What are you doing here? she asked. I found out about Aiden's condition. I was supposed to be back earlier, but he was tough with the flights and the negotiations. Chris told me you were here, so I came straight from the plane. Are you okay? Emma took two steps back and let Randy in. I'll let you two catch up. Randy nodded and walked in. Before he could say anything, Aiden ordered, Randy, 
Go help Emma at the store. Emma's face darkened. I don't need anyone to carry my things. I'm leaving now. She could not be bothered with Aiden anymore. Randy looked at Aiden questioningly, and Aiden gestured for him to follow her. Randy turned to chase after her. Emma, wait for me. That's it for today, guys. If you want to inspire me more, you can buy me a puppy. Thank you for listening.